Hello everyone and welcome to Millennial Rewind, where we take a not-so-sentimental look at the movies and TV shows that were around when millennials were growing up. I'm your host Nick, coming to you from the city whose pimptasticness is eclipsed only by Cousin It himself, Los Angeles, California. And joining me here in the City of Angels is my co-host, Jules. Jules, how are you doing today? I've come up with all kinds of creative ways to murder Christmas carolers this year. <laughs> we live in L.A. There's no Christmas here. <laughs> <laughs> and joining us from the sentient slop that Granny Adams cooked up of Southern California, the Inland Empire, is my other co-host, John. John, what's happening? I'm supplementing the household with the power of product placement. <laughs> oh, and what products might those be, John? <laughs> Tombstone <laughs> pizza? <laughs> <laughs> FedEx boxes? <laughs> <laughs> I have some tidbits about that. But before we get started even more today, uh, if you like what you hear, please do us a favor and hit that subscribe button. Also, be sure to share the show with anyone you think might like to listen as well. So this time around, we watched the 1991 kids film, The Addams Family, the latest installment in da -da -da -da. the story. And now we're sued. <laughs> Four notes and two click fingers that's owned by Warner Brothers, right? <laughs> or Paramount. Something like that. Well, let's try this anyway. John, how would you tell someone you watch <laughs> The Addams Family without saying you watch The Addams Family? Or did Jules just totally fuck that up for you? I watched a movie that's the superior version of The Munsters. Uh. A men and <laughs> jules if the producers had asked you to come up with a different title for the adams family what would it be well this was tricky because i was i don't know because it's such a good movie it's like a hidden gem but um i, I just went with family time with booberella and the osborns <laughs> it was although i don't know how how booby yeah booberella's kind of throwing me there anyway <laughs> Morticia, I don't we'll know. We'll make him explain himself later. There's the opening prop. Oh, yeah. Okay, now I see what you're getting at. We will absolutely be discussing that. <laughs> Funnily enough, I don't know whether you guys knew this, but the Adams Family started off as a New Yorker cartoon in 1938. Oh, I didn't know that. I had no idea. Yeah, it was originally a comic strip, and a lot of the reviews that I had either uh, were basically saying, one, it's not as much like the old TV show, and it's more like the comic strip, which you can really tell in this movie. It's a series of gags for the most part. Yeah, I mean, the, the few cartoons that I was able to read, definitely, you know, much more gag, like a lot more macabre. I feel like from the bit I watched of the TV show was a bit lighter. I mean, it's a 1960s TV show. You can't get too wacky with things because then society will crush you with its oppressive need for conformity but you know it would just be the latest sign of the end times that's all when it came to this movie i mean when it came to england from from my perspective at least growing up it was it was proof that america wasn't just a bunch of cheese balls <laughs> <laughs> it was proof that there was some self-deprecating humor in there and there was a beautiful little goth heart in there somewhere i thought it was one of the most endearing parts of american culture that reached the uk <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, this was not huge in South Africa. I And I had never seen this movie. I mean, I was very aware of it. I never saw it until just this week for the podcast. I know, I know John's giving me bug eyes and I deserve them. What I did watch growing up was the cartoon. Yeah, the cartoon and, and the sequel, actually. For some reason, the sequel got more hype than the first movie, which I didn't understand. I feel like the spirit of the cartoon lives in this movie or the, the, the cartoon got the spirit from the movie and continued it. It was, you know, great macabre jokes. They brought the theme song back. It, I, that, that is the Adams family for me growing up as the cartoon. And the reason why we didn't do the cartoon is because we couldn't find it anywhere. But yeah, it was one of the greatest cartoons I remember growing up. It was always one of those that you just wouldn't turn off. I always found. You just you just you just let it play and just enjoy it. <laughs> the madness of it all. The cartoon I never really saw. I loved the hell out of the cartoon for Beetlejuice, but uh, never actually saw the Adams Family one. It's very much in the same vein. This movie was absolutely huge here, though. There are scenes from this movie that were literally commercials. Yes, they were. <laughs> 
it also got an NC Hammer theme song, which uh, won a Razzie for worst song in a motion picture, beating out the title song for Cool as Ice, the Vanilla Ice movie. So MC Hammer even beat him at getting a Razzie. Wow. That final ending credit song got me so furious. I, I've <laughs> never been angrier during a credit scene than I was during this one. That is such a bad song. Well, you can rest easy knowing that it's an award winning. It's an award winning terrible song. Okay, that's good a to know. A Razzie award winning song. I felt so satisfied at the end of this movie pretty much and then and then just that song was like fuck you <laughs> what the hell is this crap oh god there was the music i'm gonna have to send you the music video if you think the song itself is shit there's a music video of course there's a music video it was an mc hammer tying into a major movie in the 90s of course there's a music video for this oh my god okay Please send. I need to watch and I need to turn it into a religion because I can only imagine how fucking amazing that music video must be. And because here's the thing. The theme song for the Adams family, the one that was, you know, popularized by the TV is pristine. It is amazing. And you get so song teased in this movie. We'll we'll talk about it more, but like you get it for like a couple of seconds. You get just the the, the melody one time and then never again never again do you get to hear this amazing song they used it as the the theme song for the cartoon they brought it back they made it even better i think but for the movie they tease you with it which i think is a is a waste so this was directed by barry sonnenfeld who directed the men in, men black, in black trilogy yep. and Wild Wild West. Yep. <laughs> this was his uh, directorial debut. And you know what? He just loves that strange font with the stretched out E's. I think. <laughs> I don't know yeah. why. It's in every single one of his movies. He just has to elongate every capitalized letter. <laughs> but he also became, by the end of the movie, the cinematographer because part of the way through the first one quit. And then the second one had to go to hospital. So not only like he was apparently stressed out as fuck making this movie because it, as John mentioned, directorial debut, it's a studio feature. And on top of dealing with the regular stress of being a director, all of a sudden he gets thrown into having to shoot the damn thing by the end. I mean, it's good that that was his background. So he was like, fuck it. I'll just do it myself. <laughs> Poor dude. <laughs> Poor dude, but it turned out really, really well. Um, Co-written by Caroline Thompson. We have talked about Caroline Thompson before because she was one of the co-writers on Homeward Bound. Ah, Homeward Bound. This is further evidence that she has no fucking excuse (laughs) for the writing on Homeward Bound because this movie is so cleverly written. This was just a chance to exhale you can feel it in the writing. You know, this is a big exhale for so many people. I felt like the prop designers had the best time of their life. I believe the prop designers didn't create a damn thing. They just walked over into their sheds and was just like, oh, here's all this shit I made five years ago. Perfect. Yep. I've been collecting for, I've been hoarding this for years and everyone called me crazy and now I have a reason. And uh, speaking of Beetlejuice, John, yeah, it was co-written by Larry Wilson. Uh, He's done a bunch of stuff, but he has a story by credit on Beetlejuice, and he produced it. Well, since we're throwing loose connections around, they really wanted Tim Burton to make this movie. They They did. did. Tim Burton did not make the film. I forget why he didn't, but they offered it to him. You think it was too on the nose? I made it dark and positive things, not dark and something that's already dark. (laughs) He says, with sunglasses indoors. I've never seen him do un- indoor sunglasses. Nice try. I've seen every interview he's been <laughs> he's been sunglasses indoors. <laughs> right, but, you know, that's great when you don't want to make eye contact with people. I get it. I get it, Tim Burton. Or hide the fact that you're clearly stoned. Does it, does it have to be mutually that's exclusive? That's just what colored lenses are for. Know your code. <laughs> <laughs> There's a sunglasses code? <laughs> or at least there is now. <laughs> for for, for the, the future patrons, we'll we'll send you a copy of John's 
sunglasses code. It'll be a roll table <laughs> in what situation, and you have to have fate decide what type of sunglasses you wear. I'll never say we don't give the patrons what they deserve. <laughs> yeah. I like how we pretend we'll ever have patrons. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's the one thing in life that I have unfounded hope for because I'm just generally (laughs) pessimistic about everything else. I have to have one thing. There's a reason why I'm pretty sure all three of us love this movie, and it's because of the great pessimism. Well, you know what? Let's not tease the audience any further. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to start breaking down The Addams Family. Hi, are you Gomez Adams? Indeed I am! On guard! No, Mr. Adams, I am not going to sword fight you. Spoil sport. I'm here from the power company. I'm here because you haven't paid your electric bill in, it seems, uh, 27 years. Preposterous! I give money to my lawyer every month to take care of our expenses. You let your lawyer pay your monthly expenses for you? That's not what lawyers do. You do realize that's not what lawyers do. Lawyers are amazing and can do anything. And you're the only person on earth who thinks that, sir. I make sure to give him enough doubloons to pay for everything. Doubloons? We accept U.S. dollars. (laughs) U.S. dollars. What a silly name for a currency. You're behind on your payments. We're going to be shutting your power off. Not sure why we didn't do this years ago, but fine. (laughs) No matter. Uh, Me and the family will tell scary stories by candlelight. And with the money you owe us, I mean, quite an insane amount, to be honest. We're going to have to strip all the copper wiring out. Likely you'll never have electricity again. Excellent! This means the house will be less magnetic. You don't process things like normal people. Well, I most likely have an undiagnosed mental illness. Would you like to go on a gondola ride in my basement while I sing Italian? (laughs) Oh, no, not falling for that one again. How about 1.21 gigawatts right to the nipples? (laughs) Wrong movie (laughs) festival. And we'll take a ride through Toontown. (laughs) And we're back. And we're going to start off with Christmas music over the Paramount logo. And I am already confused. This is uh, a Christmas movie, automatically. (laughs) Never mind the fact that apparently the very next scene is in March. Don't worry about that. It's a Christmas movie. We have carolers. And the carolers are staring completely the wrong way. The house is behind them. (laughs) And they're facing the camera. But guys, legitimately, I watched this movie this week for the first time ever. This is like 45 seconds in, and I legitimately was worried I was watching the wrong movie. (laughs) I was like, fuck, did I buy the wrong movie? What? Why is there Christmas music? Why are there carolers? Scott Rudin is the producer. By the way, uh, yeah, that that was kind of a bummer. Uh, For anybody who's not in the know about Hollywood, he is a mega producer. He's been around for a long time and has multiple, multiple allegations of severely abusing his assistants. And now we'll get sued. (laughs) Now we're going to get sued. Hey, Scott Rudin, I have like $5 to my name. You can have it. (laughs) You can have it. Allegedly. There we go. I allegedly have $5. <laughs> yes, that's what I meant. That's exactly where I was going with it. Also, I mean, okay, uh, we kind of skipped over my traditional uh, logo. It's the Paramount logo. Nothing special, but there is a, the thing is, it was supposed to be the Orion logo. Wait, what? Orion was the movie, it was the studio that owned the rights. And halfway through production, they were so worried about this being a flop. And because they were in a lot of financial trouble, they sold it to Paramount. Oh, shit. And that was a terrible mistake because this movie made a shit ton of money for 1991. It was a hit. So did everything work out for Orion Studios? (laughs) (laughs) Maybe Orion wasn't able to get those sweet, sweet MC Hammer contracts. You needed the pull of Paramount to get him in. They retain the rights to that end song, and that's it. (laughs) (laughs) The movie changed studios, and nobody told the director. (laughs) He found out (laughs) by reading the trades that the movie had been sold to a different studio. He's like, well, shit, guys, maybe a phone call would have been nice, just so I know who to send the dailies to. Can the next person who sees Sonnenfeld just give him a hug? 
I think he needs a hug. <laughs> a retrospective hug for all of this. 30 years later, he still needs a hug. <laughs> and so we pad up the house with the carolers, and we see the Adams family, and I breathe a sigh of relief. Okay, no, I'm in the right movie. My note here is my goth dream house, and uh, the movie does fail here because we don't see the destruction of the carolers. <laughs> This was very much one of the old strips. It was carolers sitting outside the house and then up at the top and they dumped the hot oil. But uh, in this movie, they just dump smoke on them because there's nothing <laughs> in this cauldron except white smoke. Dry ice hurts, okay? The, the, this is the beginning of the mysterious character in this movie who's not credited. You won't see him in the credits, but he, uh, he constantly vapes off camera. Now, I spot this on a few occasions, <laughs> but throughout the credits is when he comes out most to just this constant stream of vape. <laughs> it was early in his career and he developed his talents um, to appear on Lost as the uh, the monster. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, so it yeah. grew into the smoke more, monster. More of an yeah. on, heavy on camera <laughs> presence. And so this is where we get that just that ever slight taste of the Adams Family theme song. And it goes away so fast fucking tease it's the it's the brief intro and then you get this romantic uh this gothic romantic music which which i thought was was good too but then i didn't realize we'd end with the turdiest of turd musics of all time so yeah. and also the word adams in the adams family the logo that they go for in movie is illegible oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. you can't read that word it's like this weird scribbles, and then... When it says a Sonnenfeld film, it's it's actually written a Sonnenfeld's seven ilm. <laughs> that is, there is no way in hell that's an F. <laughs> Legally, it is not an F. <laughs> so we open up on a cuckoo clock of the Adams Family Mansion. God, this clock is amazing. This is the best prop in any movie ever. I, I retract an earlier statement. This one needed to be made, I hope. If this was just randomly in somebody's basement, that person needs help. <laughs> because it's it's got the Adams Family characters, you know, doing different cuckoo clock things. But at the center of it all, Gomez and Morticia come together. And Gomez's face just plants into <laughs> Morticia's boobs. <laughs> With the chimes of the clock. Oh my god, it is that that is where the Boobarella reference comes from. Okay. That makes sense. I was just like, damn, getting the sexual chemistry between Martitia and Gomez in early. This is how you prop <laughs> everyone. And then they show off their amazing blue screen ability of the early nineties to have Thing come out walking. Yeah, they have Thing come out and and John, I don't think you're being facetious here. And this was a big deal of how the fuck did they pull that off? Amazing. Yeah, you see things. So Thing, for anybody who isn't familiar with the characters, he's just this disembodied hand that scurries around and helps the family. And I guess he's a part of the family. Yeah, so he runs down the hallway and he finds Gomez, patriarch of the Adams family in his Fez. Yeah, my note here is uh, Thing, you know, who's, who was always my favorite character as a kid, has already shown more character than all the characters from Homeward Bound put together. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he fucking has. The best pet <laughs> is Thing. So much more personality and he literally cannot speak. And so Gomez is uh, in Fester's room and he's he's expositing about Fester being gone for 25 years and he's starting to really worry that he really is lost. And I feel like lost is once again being used as a euphemism for dead. Oh, yeah. But fun fact, when this movie came out, it was 25 years after the show had finished. Oh, is that right? So it would line up that like when the show finished up and wrapped, Fester left. <laughs> However, the timeline of this movie makes no sense. We'll get into it. Oh, no, no, not at all. <laughs> and so cut to Wednesday, Adams, the daughter, uh, played by Christina Ricci. She has Pugsley tied up and shoots an arrow into the apple that is in his mouth. It cuts away first. But... My note here is movie accurately represents all sibling relationships. <laughs> oh, my niece loves this movie. <laughs> <laughs> and while he's like struggling against his bonds, she just says to him, don't be a baby. <laughs> so good. 
<laughs> she is so monotone and matter of fact in this. It's amazing. And yes, this is exactly why I was so pissed off at the acting from the kids in Homeward Bound. See, kids are capable of acting. We see evidence in this movie. These kids <laughs> act so well, especially because you're a Well, the, the boy who's Pugsley, I think, only has like three words in the whole goddamn True, movie. true, true. But even even so, she... she. But Christina Ricci's just amazing in this. She has one moment later in the movie, which I truly believe is the most heroic heroic piece of acting I've ever seen from a child. <laughs> I think I know what you're talking about. So Gomez goes to wake up Morticia. Morticia played by Angelica Huston. Uh, she's in old movie lighting that only lights her eyes. He, She's like sleeping with her hands above her head, which just seems really uncomfortable. Yeah, but <laughs> we see later what she's into. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, we do. Uh, and Gomez is just like musing to thing about his love for Morta. She's like, I would die for her. I would kill for her. Either way, what bliss. <laughs> yeah, and then she gets to say her line, you frightened me. Do it again. My note here is thus a million S and M scenarios were born. <laughs> the way they look at each other in this scene at this point, I am still worried that I was like in the wrong movie that I had gotten the porn parody. Of the <laughs> <laughs> I was worried that I at this point that I had gotten the wrong movie still. Uh, but no, that's just how these characters interact, and it is fantastic. We also get our first instance of Morticia speaking French to Gomez, and that fucking turns Gomez's crank like nothing else. <laughs> yeah, he was already at like 12. <laughs> now he's at 90. Morticia complains about the sun being in her eyes, so he uses his store to close the blinds. And the plant on the nightstand next to her starts like, curling up and withering when the sunlight hits it and it gets better when he closes the blinds i love little shit like that. little details yeah oh the details make this movie so many times over absolutely it's... wonderful so I, I so the whole line jules i think the one that you um the, the one that you quoted it says last night you were unhinged you were like some desperate howling demon you frightened mm. me do it again. I'm just like, is Morticia seriously discussing their sex life in a that kid's movie? That is so hot. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> the grown-ups know what's going on here. This is a wealthy-ass family, and somehow they are already the most likable characters. <laughs> yeah. As, as we, we will see their wealth later, it is... And Gomez is smoking a cigar, you know, usually prime evidence of the biggest douche on the planet, and yet somehow it works, and he's likable, and you're just like, God damn. In general, the Adams family is likable. It is it is incredible. So Lurch is Lurch is kind of the 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 butler of the family. He's kind of modeled off Frankenstein. His makeup will be inconsistent throughout the film. Uh, sometimes he will, he will have more of his makeup on. Sometimes it'll just be his skin. It's uh, They have very inconsistent lurch makeup budget. I am very upset by the fact that he doesn't speak. He should speak! Instead, he just... Mm, the whole movie. Noticeably, Pugsley does not thank Lurch for his bag lunch, which is kind of rude. What a little shit. He deserves to get electrocuted. <laughs> it's okay, because he'll get, yeah, attempted murder numerous times, so it's, it's, it's absolutely <laughs> yeah. fine. Great little detail here, speaking of great details, he checks inside his lunch, and his lunch, like, screams at him. Well, and you can see there's shit moving in the bags, too. Like, they have live lunch in these brown paper bags. So on the upstairs patio, uh, Morticia is watching Gomez hit golf balls while using Thing as a T. I feel like that would hurt because you always, when you play golf, hit the T. And so if you're the T. Gomez is that awesome. He does. Apparently. It. Or he's that bad at golf that he could never actually hit the ball because thing is so much higher than your standard T. He hits the ball and he hits it into the window of his next door neighbor, who's a judge, by the way. This will be a an important thing later. Hits his cereal. Apparently a 50 something year old man is still eating cereal for breakfast. And by the way, all the characters in this movie who eat cereal will eat the same cereal for some reason. <laughs> the same colored, like, crunchy balls. 
And he comes out, damn you, Adams, just because he's not very happy about his neighbors. I have that this uh, golf ball effect is absolutely horrible and then was responsible for giving us Happy Gilmore. Yeah, you know what? (laughs) I noticed that, too. The ball traveling through the air shot is so Happy Gilmore years years ahead of its time. So just to end (laughs) off this scene, uh, what I love is that Gomez says, hey, keep the ball. I've got plenty. He holds up his bucket of balls. And I don't think that's what the judge is concerned about. By the way, does it even offer to fix his window or apologize? It's just like, oh, well, don't worry about it. I have more balls. So now we're in the greenhouse and Morticia is creating a flower arrangement by cutting (laughs) off the flower portion of roses. That's phenomenal. And Gomez is playing chess against Thing. And he's who's a fucking cheater. I miss that. What? How is he a cheater? I I believe it's when he gets to look look up because of... um... Tully and Gate. When it gets Gomez's attention, he moves pieces around. Thing moves pieces around on the board. <laughs> so Gomez mentioned that um, tonight's seance. Apparently, they have an annual seance since Fester's been gone, and that he's, he's going to be their twenty fifth, and that he's so racked by guilt and sadness. To which Morticia replies, "Don't torture yourself, Gomez." That's my job. Somehow this shit never gets old. (laughs) I don't know how. (laughs) And seriously, everything that Morticia does just turns Gomez on. Like her speculating about Fester coming back as a corpse really gets his blood going. Because she's kind of speculating about what could have happened to him. So Tully, their lawyer, shows up. And who is this actor? I've I've definitely seen him in a lot of stuff. Dan Hayeda. He's just in fucking everything he's plays a, one of his more famous roles is Nikki in cheers he's the infrequent cop in the usual suspects he plays a cuban in like an late 80s movie and it yes is he not, does <laughs> it is not an okay portrayal why do i want to say it's commando it might be commando and i think it's commando because we watched it together and it's like oh you are not latino <laughs> that is a problematic <laughs> accent yeah, Nikki from Cheers comes in. <laughs> He's their lawyer, and apparently they're his last paying client. Yeah, and his wife hates the marriage that they're in, and I take it that she proposed to him because she's doing this, oh, you're so worthless, you're terrible, da, da, da. why am I even married to you? And he goes, because I said yes. So she took the initiative. And and if you're wondering why his wife is joining him on a house call to his law office client, like, she's got business there. Um, we'll get into it and by the way he the, he has money troubles like that's also established in the dialogue with the wife so he comes inside and is immediately attacked by their polar bear rug <laughs> which is great <laughs> the polar bear rug which is still alive somehow <laughs> just imagine being a polar bear getting hunted skinned and you just can't die you just live out an endless existence on some crazy family's floor <laughs> Well, I mean, the, you never know what's alive in this house and isn't. The gate is apparently sentient because that's how they realize he's there. It's not that he gets the door and rings the bell. They hear this noise and like, oh, look, it's the lawyer. He's he's having fun playing with gate again. <laughs> his, his word was romping with gate. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so he enters a room and Gomez immediately throws a sword at his head. And his exclamation upon missing is. Ah, I missed. He intended to kill his lawyer. (laughs) Yeah, my note was casual attempted murder is casual. Very casual. So they start fencing, which is a thing that these two apparently do. It doesn't even really catch him by surprise that he almost got hit by a sword. He just pulls it out of the door and gets in his stance. And Gomez says, fine lunch, but your riposte is a tad rusty. And my note was, how did this movie know what we say during our penis fencing? (laughs) (laughs) I I had the theory that, um, I mean, obviously they would have to choreograph the scene, but I I feel like Raul Julia just received a shitload of training and this guy received none. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Raul Julia is fucking amazing in this movie. It is so tragic that he will be dead in three years. Heartbreaking. Yeah. His His last movie was Street Fighter. Fuck you, M. Bison. (laughs) That movie does not deserve him. Oh, my God. He is amazing in that. We 
Yeah, that's a must. So the way this sword fight ends is that Gomez disarms Tully, using his sword, flicks the pen out of Tully's front pocket. He throws his sword back, and then Gomez does these series of backflips into his desk chair, catching the pen and the sword. Fuck yeah, he does. It is awesome. It's phenomenal. If you're gonna have a stunt budget, use it for shit like this. <laughs> and look, I would be so much more into meetings if they were all preceded by hand-to-hand combat. I would show up for more. <laughs> and there's this weird so during this there's like this weird breakup scene because the his, Tully's wife, Margaret, that's her name, is talking to Morticia, but Morticia has some like weird housekeeping things to do going through these what happens is that she's supposed to donate something for this charity auction and uh morticia is looking for what she wants to donate she's looking for something very very particular but they have to go through the closets to find it and what makes it so perfect is uncle knickknack so they go through Uncle Knickknack's possessions, un- Uncle Knickknack's thing. Yeah, it's says, these big, giant. This is what Nick was getting at. It's these giant, like wardrobe sacks that look like body bags. And then finally, they pull out one. And says, "Oh, Uncle Knickknack." <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Knickknack's summer wardrobe. Uncle Knickknack's winter wardrobe. Uncle Knickknack. <laughs> they just keep him in the fucking closet. <laughs> There's a family cemetery out back. I mean, I don't want to tell you where to keep your dead relatives, but you seem to have a place for them. You don't leave your knickknacks out in the yard. You keep them in the house. Come on. It is half your name, goddammit. <laughs> Silly me. I should have known that. Tully is trying to convince Gomez to set up a Fester Adams retirement fund. As we all know that Fester Adams is missing and nobody knows where he is. So setting up a retirement fund for him is a little weird. Also, you're his lawyer. Why are you selling him financial things? But he wants to put it in his name, you know, for tax purposes. And Gomez, not particularly bright, loves the idea. And he celebrates this by jumping up on his desk and pulling out a sword. <laughs> Tully is clearly trying to scab Gomez out of his money because Tully, as we will learn later, owes some loan sharks money. He's trying to get this money from Gomez to try and pay back his loan shark. However, Gomez suddenly realizes, hey, actually, sorry, um, this is new business. We're not going to we cannot discuss new business until next quarter. And none of this makes sense. Nope. Go fuck yourself. It's just you have a limited window of time in the year with which to discuss things that I am not already familiar with. Well, he he flips through the calendar to get to the page where they start new business, which would be the next quarter. But this isn't like the next business or fiscal quarter because it starts in March and he flips to August. That's not when they happen. And then I didn't know if this was a, a Mandela effect thing or the fact that I had gotten uh, like from the book club, whatever thing we had, like the the kids novelization of the movie. You know, those things are like 50 pages and they have photos of the movie in the middle. But I remember something to the effect of what um, Gomez actually flipped to. Maybe this was an original script thing that got changed. It was the next uh, like moon phase. So when he's saying next quarter, Tully's thinking months away for business quarter. And it's supposed to be like two weeks when it's the next phase of the moon. Can, can we get to Lurch in the French maid outfit? Uh, we're almost there. We're, we're getting there. Because now it is time for Gomez to go to the vault and get the money for the monthly expenses, which he apparently pays for through his lawyer. That That's a thing that normal people do. <laughs> I never thought he meant like, all expenses like the mortgage and the bills and stuff it was just because you know the lawyer's on retainer so he gets a regular expense right but it all it came across to me as he's the guy who pays the bills for them because we got you on retainer (laughs) put your ass to work i don't know well he sure as hell isn't paying the landscapers i can tell you that much the vault where they keep the family fortune is behind a secret 
bookshelf passageway. And let's be honest, who did not want a secret passage in their home growing up? I still want one now and I live in an apartment building. <laughs> As do I. This building was made in the 1920s. You can't tell me there's not one secret passage in here. It's bullshit. So Tully kind of watches him because Tully clearly wants to know where the family fortune is so he could get the money, but can't really see which book got pulled out to activate the thing he pulls out uh, a magical book as we find out all these books are magical he pulls out gone with the wind and then the wind blows which which you know i thought was a terrible terrible joke but it makes up for it by then cutting to lurch outside the door watching him in a french maid outfit and yes. dust it. you are weirdly appreciative of this costume choice <laughs> i loved it uh, honestly my note here is there is not one scene that couldn't be improved by intercutting lurch watching <laughs> in a french maid outfit and duster i really i don't know why that's not a meme that's that's Internet, you failed me. We'll make it happen. So back in, I guess, the junk room, uh, Morticia gives Margaret an insanely ornate set of finger cuffs that are supposedly from the court of Emperor Wu. And I want to know how the hell Thing got there. Yes, me too. Because Thing is up on top of the shelf like he he, he snaps and points because the, the thing she's looking for is sitting right next to him. But he was in the room with Gomez and Tully because he, like, caught the swords and helped put them away and shit. Yeah, he teleported down here. This is... So, Granny really wants to keep the finger cuffs. And Morticia's like, no, Mama, it's for it's for the widows and orphans. We need we more need of them. We need more of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. And while I, this is all going on... Margaret gets her finger stuck in the finger cuffs. Did you notice how she clearly got it stuck several times before the sound effects guy decided to actually make it really stick? No. What? No. Oh, her fingers go in and out well, of the Well, she constantly. kind of is messing with it and then it finally trips it is the way I took it. Yeah, but I swear she put her finger in far deeper early on in those cuts than she did when it finally clicked. Yeah, she did. <laughs> mm-hmm. If you know what I mean. Yeah, so if Morticia also wants her and Tully to come to the seance tonight, you know, Gomez is in a lot of distress over Fester being missing. And she says to Margaret, he won't eat. He can't sleep. He keeps coughing up blood. And Margaret's like, holy shit. And she says, and Morticia replies, well, not like he used to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, most of this episode is going to be me quoting Morticia because her lines are the fucking best. Eventually, Gomez comes back and he weighs out some doubloons because that's how he pays his fucking monthly expenses with like Spanish galleons and then puts them in Tully's briefcase and he gives it to him by weight, not by quantity. It's so weird. So weird. So now we're back in Tully's office. Well, not back. It's our first time in Tully's office. And we meet Mrs. Craven. And Tully owes money to her. And we also meet her son, Gordon, who looks just like Fester. And I'm just going to spoil it here because if you have one active brain cell, you figure this out really freaking early in the film. Gordon is Fester. Fester, who doesn't know that he's Fester, he believes that he's this woman's son. I think they couldn't figure out how to actually make him Uncle Fester. Yeah, this was such a weird thing for me, story-wise. We'll get, we'll get to the forced point at the very end. Yeah, at the very end where it gets very forced that he was Fester all along, but every single thing we've seen of Fester all along is he is always completely bald. And this guy needs to have his head shaved to be Fester. Even as a kid, he was always completely bald. And now he's got Jufro. <laughs> he does. <laughs> and he's kind of the muscle of the operation. He literally shakes Tully down for his money. He grabs him by the neck, inverts him, turns him upside down. And then Tully dies because if you put that much stress on someone's neck, it's going to snap and they're going to die. Tully, when they see the... Uh, the doubloons that Tully has brought back, he explains that, yeah, the Adams 
are rich and they got a ton of those. They got them in a vault. I just don't know where the vault is. So they concoct this plan to shave this dude's head and have him be festered. So back at the Adams family house, there's a there's a lightning storm going on. And they have to call the kids inside because they're standing out in the rain holding an antenna while there's a lightning. <laughs> and enjoying themselves. Having a great time. They're laughing. They're just enjoying life. Playing with death. Like kids will. Yeah, like kids will. It's it's like they listed out all the you can't do this at home kids. <laughs> right. <laughs> all into a massive list and tried to cram every single one into this movie. Morbid child wish fulfillment. Kids don't do this at home. And then they just took the list from the FCC and were just like, okay, we're going to include that, that, that. <laughs> yeah. They did everything short of having them pet a lion. <laughs> Since you brought it up, the uh, it's not featured in the movie, but the Adams do have a pet lion named Kitty. Who you actually hear when Gomez was going to the vault, you hear the roar and he says, Down Kitty. Oh. It's replaced by a stupid water slide for no reason, but we'll get there. Yeah, so we're at a CD motel now, and Tully, Craven, and Fester are scheming. I'm just going to call him Fester. Like they refer to him as Gordon, but I'm just going to call him Fester because it's Fester. We know it's Fester. Like you would have to be brain dead to not figure out that this guy's actually Fester. Um, and so Tully says that if they shave Gordon's head, He'll look exactly like Uncle Fester. Let's him know that Gomez is feeling super guilty about Fester leaving and going missing, and he'll tell him. And just an idiot in general. So. Just an idiot in general. And so go in, pretend you're Fester, let you know where the vault is, clean him out of house and home. Craven tells Tully that the plan better work, kicks him out. And look, I'm no loan shark, but I'm pretty sure that loan sharks don't work extra to make the money <laughs> that their debtors owe for them. Like I, I finished the Sopranos after we watched it for the show and never does that ever happen. This, these are very bad loan sharks. <laughs> and so Craven and Fester basically say that, Hey, if we pull this off, you know, we don't have to loan shark anymore. We don't have to con people. We'll just be set for life. Fester says, you know, not Gordon fester like he's he's going to adopt the role he's in tully and margaret arrive for the seance uh margaret is still stuck in the finger cuffs yes she from is. earlier like went home i don't know whether she changed but if she changed how so i believe she's wearing something different though i wasn't sure how that happened she's like spray on evening wear like how did you do that <laughs> Um, it needs Wednesday's help getting him off. Uh, Morticia appears down the steps or the entrance hall and offers some of Granny's entrail appetizers. And I don't know whether you guys noticed, but you hear that same spooky bit of music that you hear in the pilot episode of South Park when Cartman's getting abducted. That wee, wee, wee. It's very faint. It's like the Wilhelm scream of 90s spooky stuff. Like, it's <laughs> you definitely hear it. It must be in the public domain because you hear a lot of it. I did enjoy, actually, that this movie um, will go on to show that seances are nothing but scammers trying to take your shit and take advantage of you. <laughs> yes, it is the official position of Millennial Rewind that seances are bullshit. Uh, by the way, they're trying to do a seance for someone who might be alive. Yep, so <laughs> it's a teleportation ritual, I believe. Yeah, to mood music on an organ played by Lurch. Well, you got to have mood music for your seances. I mean, that's just... that's book one of con artist douchebag. Yeah, you got to set the mood. Granny's got her crystal ball. Gomez has to tell Pugsley to not chop his sister up with a meat cleaver. Ah, uh, kids. And he like treats her like, oh, you scamp. No, 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 no. You can, you can dismember your sister later, but for right now, we've got a seance. And we are 18 minutes into this movie, and Pugsley has not had a single line. I honestly think he has like four words in the whole movie. He barely says anything. And so they start the seance. They can put, you know, hands... Together, eyes closed. There's the thing hand gra gag. Yeah, the oh thing you're a handful. Th those were the only bad jokes I think in this entire movie, with the jokes about thing being a handful and lending a hand. Those were the two face slapping ones. <laughs> I, I enjoyed them. I enjoyed those jokes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Nick's opinion has officially been unvalidated. I like silly things. Anyway, so. <laughs> What the hell was that? I 
<laughs> Anyways, uh, so Granny is stroking her crystal ball and commands Fester to knock on the door. And there's a knock at the door. Very, very loud knocks to which Granny has to say, did you hear that? And by the way, like as things get more intense, the music gets like Lurch knows how to keep the mood going <laughs> throughout the sale. Lurch knows his job, man. Thing runs downstairs and lo and behold, it's Fester who doesn't think he's Fester. He thinks he's an infiltrator on behalf of this con artist lady. And we have the return of hidden vaping man behind Fester. Who uh, who stays with his jacket even after he goes inside and continues vaping behind him. Yeah, there's like smoke on his shoulders when they bring him inside. It's not smoke. Clearly rose flavored vape. I was supposed to say, but what flavor of vape? <laughs> and by the way, when they open the door, they see Fester. Fester looks like a deer in the headlights slash somebody had just farted. Like he had just farted. Like <laughs> he'd wish they'd open the door a few seconds later. Like they came out just as the smell was bad. Eh, he's the muscle thug. He's the muscle bound thug. He's not sure how he's going to be able to improv through this. He just, you know, he got that bit of stage fright. So Gomez immediately believes it's his brother who's come back. Doesn't even question it. But also, Craven is there, and she is saying that her name is Dr. Pinterschloss. She puts on a German accent because Germans mean evil. Oh, I think Germans mean psychiatrist. <laughs> that is also a stereotype. And so they have a family meeting. Uh, Craven slash Pinterschloss uh, explains that Fester was found in Miami about a month ago, trapped in a tuna net. And after creating an extensive psychological profile, Florida's Department of Fish and Game determined that he was Fester. Fucking what? <laughs> Are they supposed to be in Florida? How would the Floridians know about the Adamses in the first place? <laughs> I don't think the Department of Fish and Game in any state does psychological profiles of people. <laughs> <laughs> It's an obvious bullshit story. And Margaret, bless her, immediately calls bullshit. She says, isn't this the most ridiculous thing you've ever heard? And Gomez is like, yes, it is. And then he doesn't give a Which fuck. Which means he accepts it even more wholeheartedly. I know. Because he's Gomez. So Fester says he can only stay there for about a week because he got these big things going on in the Bermuda Triangle. That's That's where he was. And the very mention of the Bermuda Triangle turns Gomez and Morticia on. I think they went on a second honeymoon there. Wednesday's going to talk about how nothing can escape the Bermuda Triangle. So I think this is one of the many plot holes. Crossed line, I think. The... <laughs> Between plot writer and gag writer, I think. One was writing the gags, the other was writing the plot, and sometimes they didn't compare notes. Yeah, you might be onto something there. I would say they didn't escape the Bermuda Triangle. They got kicked out. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, the Bermuda Triangle is just like too much weirdness here. <laughs> <laughs> we need you to stop having sex with each other every five seconds in front of us. <laughs> and so Dr. Pinterschloss slash Mrs. Craven uh, says that she won't be able to stay with them either, be, you know, because having two con people working at this location would make things a lot easier and they could cover <laughs> more ground. It would make more sense. But because it makes a lot of sense, she's not going to do it. We finally get a line from Pugsley. He's been trying to open Fester's suitcase with acid and he finds a bear trap in there. He gets snagged with a bear trap and he's like, cool, not Al, cool. It's cool that I'm snagged in a bear trap. This is a healthy environment for children. And also Wednesday calls bullshit on the whole Bermuda Triangle thing because she knows a lot about the Bermuda Triangle. That's her fucking thing. Like her to the Bermuda Triangle is like me to war. Like that is how into <laughs> it she is. Okay. Because not, nobody ever gets out. Craven's super condescending. <laughs> I love this. I tell her, you know. She has so much to learn that the Cuban spirit is a hard thing to kill, to which Granny replies, even with a chainsaw. And then we cut to a chainsaw. We cut to a chainsaw, but what I really want in this world is to see Granny Adams trying to kill the human spirit with a chainsaw. I just would like to see that visual. So, like, she's a ghostbuster? She's a ghostbuster, or she's just, like, killing people because the spirit lies within them. 
<laughs> with a chainsaw. Well, then all she's doing is setting it free, and it's even harder to get tracked down and kill. Come on, Granny. So yeah, so Fester's unpacking in his room. He's a little uneasy about where he is. Uh, unpacks a chainsaw, as John was mentioning. And Morticia comes to help him, but Fester is scared that she's going to find the things that he's packed suspicious. Like, he's got a crowbar in there. She's going to clue in to, yeah, the crowbar. Um, St- bundle you know, of sticks, dynamite Bundle stick. of dynamite, like he's a cartoon character. You but know? she's not phased by any of it. In fact, when she pulls out a vial of cyanide. She's like, Fester, as if we would run out. <laughs> She's, like, offended that he brought his own cyanide. Yes! (laughs) This is like when you're hosting a get-together, like, a little dinner party, and you're like, hey, I've already taken care of everything. There's no reason to buy, you know, no reason. And someone shows up because, well, they only eat this kind of bread. (laughs) She's like, faster, really? Come on. Take take note of this, cult members. Before you drink the Kool-Aid, remember it's rude to bring your own cyanide. (laughs) Yeah, Fester kind of notices Wednesday staring at him out in the hallway. He kind of goes back into his room and starts looking at some of the photos, trying to get clues of things so he'll have something to talk about. Notices a picture of Fester and Gomez's kids in cages. Uh, at a place called Camp Custer. Uh, He'll bring that up. We also see a picture of these twins called Flora and Fauna. Pin in them. They will be important later. For exposition. (laughs) Yeah. For expositional reasons. Checks back in the hallway, and Wednesday has hung a voodoo doll on her doorknob by the neck. There's a lovely couple of flags on the wall. University of Alcatraz and Desert of Maine flags. (laughs) So yeah, so now it's bedtime, so Fester gets into his bed. It sinks really deep. He should probably get a new mattress. The springs on this one are completely fucked. All of a sudden, there's a gust of wind, and he gets freaked out by Thing. Like, Thing comes in and just, like, grabs his leg, and he starts screaming. And screaming really loud, so loud that Gomez and Morticia hear him in from their room. And Gomez says, screams in the night can mean only one thing. And Morticia says, he's home. (laughs) <laughs> like he could be in danger he could be in pain nope he's screaming he's good it's just like it was so the next morning gomez startles fester awake fester pulls a knife on him and gomez is just like oh cool playtime yeah as if this was totally expected <laughs> yeah he flips him over and he's like ah oh, it's good to have you back does some judo and he's just like oh you <laughs> hey two out of three <laughs> <laughs> so now we're at breakfast in the uh, Adams family kitchen slash potions lab. <laughs> Wednesday turns to Fester and says, pass the salt. To which uh, Morticia, you know, horrified at her manners, says, what, what do, do we you say? say? And she says to Fester Wednesday, now. <laughs> Again, like Jules was saying, child wish fulfillment. So much of it. And I don't know why they try to make a big deal out of this breakfast. This is this is the finest British cuisine you've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, it's so weird. She puts all this green slop in Fester's bowl or plate or whatever. And I'm just like, I know this is supposed to be disgusting, but this reminds me of a really delicious Thai green puri I had. And I just really <laughs> wanted some after seeing this. <laughs> Like I said, this is what I grew up on. Did you also start with the eyes, as Granny suggested? Of course, you had to start with the eyes and then the brains. <laughs> yeah, they get cold really quick. So Morticia asks Fester how he slept, and he's like, oh, like the dead. And Gomez points out that that's really weird, because uh, before they brought him back from the Bermuda Triangle, he used to toss and turn so badly they'd have to tie him to the bedpost. And the night started with you screaming your ass off, so there's that too. But also we get a bit more interrogation from Wednesday. This is where we learn that she's a Bermuda Triangle expert. Kind of almost dares Fester to test her knowledge. She's like, ask me anything. But instead of asking her anything, he tries to deflect by talking to Gomez and being like, hey, do you remember Cab Custer in the good old days? He's like, oh, you know, hey, maybe we can wander around the house and I can remember more stuff. And Gomez is like, nope, there's not going to be any wandering today. And Fester's like, oh. Gomez is like, fuck that. We got a plot to get to. Damn yeah. <laughs> Gomez is like, because we're going straight to the vault. And Fester's like, okay, good. And then uh, Pugsley comes in doing his part for every American automobile driver in the world. Yeah. 
<laughs> yes, he takes out a stop sign. He comes in with a stop sign. He's clearly taken that out of an intersection. And the family stops to listen to the sounds of traffic chaos. Yeah, this is as if they were like right underneath the street or something. <laughs> And they are proud of him. They are treating this like it's an accomplishment. I would be. And put a pin in this because there is, this gag does get followed up on a little later. <laughs> yes, it does. I have notes about it. Yeah, they could be listening to the sounds of people getting mangled and dying. And they're just like, boy. That's what I tell my kids. So Gomez takes Fester the vault. They're at the, uh, the bookcase. And the book that they need to pull to activate... The passageway is called Greed, and I think it was writ- written by an Adams. I think that was the author. It was like something, something Adams. Then they have to go inside, pull a chain, and there's a ton of chains. You don't like it's. You can hardly tell which one he pulls, and that sends them down a slide. There was this weird thing with '90s movies. Uh, well, it was kind of a bit of late '80s too. With, like, a sliding section of the movie. Goonies had a big waterfall or water slide scene. This has it. Like, Mario Brothers was, like, a a sliding through the pipe slide scene. This happened weirdly frequently that there had to be a sliding scene in a movie for a while. It was weird as well. For starters, this is the most unscary slide on the planet. And we're (laughs) supposed to believe that Fester would be scared of it. Second of all... Did you notice the strange music note? It was like folk English comedy music that was going along with it. Whilst it was going down. very out of place yeah. relative to it the rest of the off. film. It was off. It was just, I don't know if they intended to make the slide scary and they lost the budget because they spent it all on the boob cuckoo clock. But the boob clock. <laughs> my my headcanon is they, they get off of the slide at the bottom and you can see like it's spiral maybe two complete turns and that that's literally all there was to the slide and they had to just keep shooting take after take on this like i was thinking the same thing like for them to go down this slide there are taken three levels of edit cuts to get down this fucking slide this was this was a three foot slide that they shot nine thousand times (laughs) but also how do they get up again i don't see a ladder anywhere is there an elevator we didn't see? It's not very well explained. They, they could have just walked up that slide. <laughs> you know, there was, it was decorated with Christmas lights. It wasn't steep. This is the least <laughs> scary slide in movie history. Yeah, it's just there to be there. And at the bottom, uh, there's for some reason a Venetian gondola. There's a fucking boat. <laughs> to take them to the vault. There's just apparently a series of canals under the house. A, a replica of the um, sewage system underneath Paris for some reason. And so they gondola away while Gomez plays Italian music because why the fuck not? He puts the whole hat on and everything. <laughs> and Fester is still freaking the fuck out so that when like Gomez starts to pull the gondola, Fester has this look like Gomez is just going to beat the shit out of him. with it. He's like, I'm not going to wake up with my kidneys. Uh, so now we're in the kids' room. Uh, Pugsley and Wednesday are debating whether or not it's the real Uncle Fester. It's been 25 years since he's been missing. Neither of them have ever met him. Correct. They have no baseline for like what Uncle Fester is supposed to act like. Wednesday tells Pugsley to sit in an electric chair that she's been prepping because they're going to play a game. And what's the name of the game? It's called, and the camera pushes into her face and she says, is there a God? It's the game I play with Nick all the time. (laughs) And it's not overrated. <laughs> There's never a light at the end of the tunnel. I it's always just blackness. So Gomez continues to gondola and sing Italian music. Seriously, it is cavernous. Clearly, some blue screen CGI here too. Oh, there's some matte. No, they're not CGI. This is like this is this is not CGI. This is there's a lot of matte paintings. They have to like paint do matte paintings on a piece of glass and stick it in front of the camera lens, and that's what does the per, you know the forced perspective stuff. So they reach the vault, but Fester doesn't remember the code. Two ten eleven eyes fingers toes. How could you forget that? 
So inside, it's not actually the vault. It's their man cave. It's where they hang out. They got a bar. They got a movie projector. And let me tell you, I need these brandy glasses in my life. I was about to say, they've got those enormous brandy glasses that you get at like Spencer's or something. They're Titanic. If you were to put a goldfish in there, they would get agoraphobia. These are how big <laughs> these brandy glasses are. And so Gomez is like, hey, man, old man, if these walls can talk, you know, with all the good times we've had down here. And Fester has no memories. He's like, oh, what would they say? Ah, go get us a brandy. Don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, so while pouring a brandy, Gomez is going through a film box. Fester accidentally discovers the vault. He opens a random bottle of booze and that activates another secret passage where the the thing he's standing on with the bar spins around and he's in the room, just the gold room. This is Scrooge McDuck's vault. And there was definitely some weird effect here where they were using mirrors to make this room seem bigger than it was. But you only get the briefest of glimpses of it. They were just like, okay, this is where the gold is. Let's get back. Comes back in. Gomez, while searching through the film box, hears some sort of creature there, like beats it to death with a bowling (laughs) pin. (laughs) It's now it's family movie time. In the movies, you see Gomez, young Gomez and young Fester playing pranks, scaring people with the the shark fins that you put on your back i saw one in one of those shark fin things when i after i saw this movie as a kid (laughs) yeah and they're at a lake they're like at a small lake or maybe a river with fucking shark fin brains you're gonna scare the shit out of somebody they they do not expect lake sharks (laughs) (laughs) nobody expects lake shark (laughs) and then there's also a shot of fester holding dynamite which is why I guess Morticia wasn't surprised he had dynamite. We now see the brothers at a ball. They're still young, but they're kind of like teenage years. And Gomez asks Fester if he remembers that fateful night. And Fester tries to throw a wild guess out there as to what happened. That he's like, ah, it was your first cigar. And Gomez is like, what? Come on, old man. I've smoked since I was five. Mother insisted. (laughs) Oh, my note here is is Gomez stole my excuse, the son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and so now we see Flora and Fauna from the pictures from earlier, and the truth comes out about why Gomez feels guilty. Because Fester was into them, I guess Gomez seduced them both out of pride, and now he believes that, you know, because he snagged Flora and Fauna from him, Fester ran away. Gomez just exposits about their backstory. So, uh, John, about the time, you know, can you ever forgive me for our backstory? No. (laughs) It's good to know. So Fester forgives Gomez, and Gomez is so excited that he puts Fester in a headlock. However, Fester has forgotten their super secret password and their special names for each other. And he sleeps well. There's something going on with this so-called Fester. And so back in the kids' room, Wednesday is very certain that Fester is an imposter. She also has Pugsley strapped down nice and tight in this electric chair. He is securely seated, and he's getting the bowl put on his head right now. I'm not sure if if she used the brine sponge or not. I don't see, I don't think she did, because you don't see anything dripping down. Yeah, exactly. So she's trying to make it more painful. <laughs> That's the thing. We're getting to the moment where she has one of the best acting moments I've seen from any child actor ever. Yeah, we're getting there. So Morticia comes in. You know, Wednesday's warming up the electric chair and she's... This is probably my favorite joke in the whole movie. And she's not upset because Wednesday's about to fry her brother in an electric chair. She's upset because they're going to be late for the charity auction. And we don't have time for this. We don't have time for this. Like, oh, and literally Pugsy's like, please. Please. Yes, it's Pugsley who says please. And so Morticia's just like, oh, all right. <laughs> and so Wednesday <laughs> throws the switch. And holy shit, Jules, I think this is what we were we were both kind of clicking on this. The facial expressions on Christina Ricci's face. Gold. Amazing. I have noted Christina Ricci's demonic glee is my world. It is absolute <laughs> perfection. I want I want that expression everywhere. 
<laughs> so now we're at the charity auction. Margaret is still stuck in these finger cuffs. She's like re-clicked into these finger cuffs. Yeah, she's got herself trapped yet again so that when they're talking about the item, she's holding her hands out. <laughs> and again, I think Inside she's of. in a different outfit. How did she change? I, I will say that she got changed before getting re-trapped. Gomez and Morticia get really into the bidding and they start outbidding each other for the thing that they donated. And just getting more and more turned on. Until they're pretty much full on boning on the auction floor. Oh, the camera, you know, they 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 eventually cap it off at fifty thousand dollars, and the camera looks at the the auctioneer, who's the judge neighbor, and we hear some very graphic audio <laughs> noises coming <laughs> off camera. I I remember I, I texted you guys. I'm like, are are Gomez and Morticia fucking at the auction? <laughs> to which I replied, When are they not fucking? <laughs> yeah. This is true. They're either pre-coital or coitling in this in this movie. Nothing in between. Coitling, I like that. <laughs> and so they, they drive home with their finger cuffs. Fester gets caught in the finger cuffs, but he doesn't know how to take them off. And this is kind of the final straw for Gomez. Gomez is now convinced that he's not his brother. Because these were party favors at his 10th birthday. And he does, he's kind of put the clues together. Asking these questions while taking his frustrations out on his model trades. I never understood this scene. Except for the great joke that there's a tiny little passenger in there. But like the whole house is shaking as if there's a real train. Like a full size one. Everyone in the house is aware of like where the little train is running. And that this is such a bad thing. They're like, Dead Man's Curve, the old rickety bridge, like, holy shit, you know, it's like, but there's no tension here. It's just a model train set running around. Yeah, I mean, I think it's also just to show it, like, to have the family be distracted, because while this is going on, Fester is strapping gadgets on to try and get into the vault. He fails miserably, he pulls the wrong chain, some mechanical arm grabs him and <laughs> yanks him up. Uh, he ends up getting flushed out Pugsley's escape hatch. Yeah. I, I mean, there's one for Pugsley because we see their names on there. One for Pugsley on the left, one for Wednesday on the right. The positions of these outlet shoot <laughs> covers will not be consistent in this film. They will change. But since we're talking about Pugsley's possessions, yes, Morticia, he and Wednesday are huddled together in this worried moment about father in his room. And you know it's his room because there are at least 53 stop signs. Uh, several <laughs> yield, do not walk, do not enter. <laughs> he has stolen so many fucking traffic signs from the local area. Pugsley is my hero. Pugsley has murdered some motherfuckers. He has definitely <laughs> caused some accidents, at the very least grievous bodily harm. He he has inadvertently contributed. He he did not set out with the intention. I feel like it's very vertent. I don't want to say inadvertent. He he's very this was very deliberate. Wednesday tries to kill him, he tries to kill everyone else. That's the shtick. So really, Wednesday is our protector when you think about yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. So somehow Morticia has materialized outside, despite having been in the kids in Pugsley's room listening to Gomez's trains. And she's there to greet Fester as he recovers from his ride and takes him through a stroll through the family graveyard, pointing out various Adamses and the horrible ways they died. Oh, I missed one thing, by the way. You know, when he comes out of the chute, did you notice the fish that came out with him? Yes, there's fish. Why are there fish in the, the <laughs> pipe? And why are they not dead? Wasn't there a shot where you saw him traveling through like a, a water tube, though? Doesn't explain the fish. You can have water tubes without. And who's feeding the fish? <laughs> Granny, obviously. There was like a giant tuna in there. <laughs> yeah, so during the cemetery stroll, she points out one of the graves with the family crest that's got the family motto on it and mentions that it translates to, We devour those who would subdue us. Not a very not so subtle threat towards Fester. And this freaks him out. Is this mess is this message in Latin or ancient Greek? It's not Murican, so I didn't pay attention. 
John's got the right answer. <laughs> and so now Fester's freaked out. He calls mother, uh, Dr. Uh, not Dr. Craven, Mrs. Craven slash Dr. Penterschloss for backup. She comes in, does her Dr. Penterschloss technique, and calms Gomez down with some bullshit theory about displacement and how it's really Gomez's guilt that's causing him to reject Fester. And Gomez just buys this bullshit hook, line, and sinker. He's But there are some great jokes in here. Like, she's trying to steer him to the fact that he's, like, jealous and has all this baggage, but, you know, because you have the little black monster, the monster that follows you around. <gasps> Pugsley! <laughs> <laughs> and she tries to pull, like, a typical Freudian sort of thing, but, I mean, gets it a little bit wrong about, like, hating your mother and that sort of thing. And he goes, I didn't hate mother. It was an accident. <laughs> oh, that was my favorite line. That's <laughs> God, that was amazing. Everyone's response to every therapist in the history of the world. <laughs> <laughs> so while this is going on, Fester happens upon Pugsley and Wednesday practicing a sword fight for a Shakespearean scene. And he is very unimpressed by how Wednesday gets stage stabbed, but with a sword. Shows them a book of gore and like really inspires them to get into it. And this is kind of the start of him bonding with the kids. He also shows them how to blow stuff up. They go outside, like blow a hole in the driveway with the dynamite. Uh, but Craven sees Fester getting along with the kids and is not happy about this. I also kind of enjoy the fact that Gomez's reaction to his mental health issue. He's so excited that he has a mental health disorder. <laughs> I wish this was the case for all mental health disorders. I think that would remove all stigma if everyone just reacted the way Gomez did. I have a terrible mental illness. Isn't that great? Multiple personalities. I'll never be lonely again. <laughs> I don't know if that's how multiple personality disorder works, but I hope it does. I hope they all are not lonely. Anyways, um, so she, in fact, uh, Craven forbids Fester from going to this play of theirs because it will be the perfect opportunity to go for the vault because the house will be empty. And at this point, we kind of start seeing fake Fester, who's actually real Fester, getting Stockholm Syndrome for his real family. There is a heartwarming moment of them two with the golf. Yeah, they, 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 after this, they him and Gomez are on the same patio where Gomez was playing golf earlier and Gomez apologizes for not believing him. They have this, you know, reconciliation fester, you know, talks about how he's feeling out of place here. And Gomez says, no, you're home. And then they bond by both driving golf balls at the same time into their judge neighbor's window. <laughs> And with those windows being broken, we're going to be taking a quick break. And when we come back, we will break down the second half of The Adams Family. Oh, Gomez, how wonderful of you to take us on vacation to the Bermuda Triangle. Anything to see you in a bathing suit, my dear. The sand is so coarse. The sun is cooking us alive. I love it. And I love you, my darling. Uh, uh, excuse me. Well, hello there, strange-looking fellow. Take your clothes off. No. I'm here on, on business, actually. My, my name is Zanblop, and I'm one of the aliens who abducts people so they disappear forever from the Bermuda Triangle. Gomez, he looks positively revolting. I want to adopt. Tish, are you saying what I think you're saying? The hell, lady. Uh, I, I'm a fully grown adult. That is rude. No, you cannot adopt me. You cannot keep me. We are the ones who take you away from Bermuda Triangle. Look, the whole reason I'm here is I just want to ask you to tone it down, okay? Tone it down? Whatever do you mean? I, I don't know. It looked like German snuff porn or something right there for a moment. Seriously, we've been to sick places in the galaxy, and you two... You're a bit much. Gomez, me, these three spider crabs, that's just how we express our love. No, nowhere in the galaxy do beings express love by teeming spider crabs and hop seals. But of course they do. It's our love language. And no one smothers themselves in coconut oil to entice insects to bite them while they're doing it. 
Uh, uh, sir, please, we're having having a conversation here. Can you keep your fingers out of your wife? Hard pass. Okay, see? As, this is what I mean. You do all this where we can see you. It's super distracting for alien stuff. I can't believe this. We're letting you go. You have to leave Bermuda Triangle. Go. Leave? But I haven't finished fingering my wife. No, see, it's our job to make people disappear here, but we just can't with all this. I, I just can't. Gomez, shall we make love one more time before we go? I've never done it in front of an alien. Carmia. No, no. No, just go. Just, just. Oh my God! Can you make a video? Je t'adore, Gomez. Why, Tish? Was that French? Jawohl, mein Herr. I don't care. That's hot anyway. <laughs> 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 And we're back. It's now the day of the play. And Fester, through the door to his room, tells the kids while fighting off tears that he will not be coming to help them with their play because Craven said he couldn't. We're now that evening at the talent show. The parents are arriving for it. And Wednesday's teacher intercepts Morticia because she needs to talk to her. <laughs> and uh, folks, okay, if you're, I'm sure that anybody who's listening to this is somewhat familiar with the Adams family, but for anybody who isn't, just to give a visual idea of just how bizarre this family is relative to the rest of the world, obviously they're kind of got these spooky, gothic, haunted mansion vibes. Deal, they deal with a lot of macabre subjects. Magic clearly exists in their house. But Morticia Adams herself is just tall and has the palest of skin, long black hair, and just a long black dress. Like, your goth girlfriend. She's the bride of Frankenstein without the crazy hair. Exactly. Couldn't have said it better myself because I didn't. And so, yeah. So she's clearly <laughs> doesn't fit in this world. And so the teacher basically goes, hey, so we had this assignment recently where kids were start supposed to bring in pictures of their heroes. Oh, God. I love this one. I love it so much. The heroes include George H.W. Bush, who was the president at the time. Such a cheesy president, too. That's what made it so perfect the pinnacle of conformity versus the adams family who are definitionally just non-conformists I, I think that another one was some a real i forget her name but she was a real journalist at the time she was like really popular in the early 90s i guess late 80s early 90s it was it was like supposed to be jane Pauley, i think yes jane Pauley. that's who it was but yeah all these all these prominent media you know political figures common stuff maybe kids do the president a celebrity maybe there's probably quite a few athletes up there and then we get to Wednesdays. <laughs> Wednesdays brought in a hand-drawn sketch of her hero, her great aunt who was burned at the stake for being a witch. <laughs> and, and, and Morticia mentions how Wednesday really looks up to this great aunt, but it's okay. We always tell her college first. <laughs> hey, she could be a witch if she wants to. Just get that degree first. <laughs> God, that's fantastic. This entire world is why I loved goth culture so much. It's so fantastic. And this is what I love about the Adams family. They are so unashamedly, unapologetically themselves. Exactly. They are not they don't conform to society and they are so comfortable with who they are. Other people criticizing them are kind of nudging that what they do is out of the normal. They don't even perceive it. That is how comfortable they are with themselves. It's so endearing. They're, they're not acting out. They're not being there to be against you. They're just weird. That this, They just are. This is where the genuinely superb morality breaks through. You know? <laughs> it's, it's the superb meaning behind the story is just so fantastic. And one last mention of this picture. For anyone, it's a hand-drawn picture, and it is the exact kind of picture that gets you sent to the psych ward. <laughs> that is, that yes, is, it is it was straight out of the ring you know <laughs> easily so margaret and tully are also at this performance it's a, a talent show 
and their kid is there. Their kid dressed as Link from fucking Legend of Zelda. He's an elf, but <laughs> I was going to go like... with Peter Pan, but okay. And this is where they accurately p- portray how horrifying just ordinary parents are. Right, because she's like, oh, he's my little boy. And like Margaret starts, you know, pulling, pinching his cheeks and doing this. And then she commits a fucking crime against humanity because she takes out her fucking handkerchief licks it and uses it to wipe his face down this is where they they contrast it with the true horrors of being that conformist parent (laughs) no wonder he ran away to the desert to hang out with sam neill oh god it is that kid it's the kid from the beginning of jurassic park that he fucks with with the raptor claw oh my god yes yes he is yeah and this guy uh, he's about to become your hero. His name is Whit Hertford, and he's had a big career in live theater. He's he's studied and served in prominent positions like in Russia and UK, London, and all that. He did an LGBTQA. I think maybe the A is asexual. I'm not sure. A is asexual. Yes. Reimagining of Romeo and Juliet. That they performed in Salt Lake City. Oh, my God. Fuck yeah, Mormons. <laughs> Deal with it. <laughs> so, yeah, Whit Hertford, kid from Jurassic Park, became our hero. Yes, he did. He had to get, you know, gross licked handkerchief faced beforehand, but he did it. And Sam Neill had to threaten to slice his stomach open with a claw. <laughs> This guy, this guy has two seconds on camera, and he acts superbly well in both those movies. And those kids in Homeward Bound couldn't find one minuscule moment of genuine experience in their entire script. Audience, I don't think you get how much Homeward Bound screwed us up. Hey, I, again, I stand by. Jamie was awesome. Hope could be annoying, but fine. Fuck Peter. You have to listen to all of our episodes is what we're saying. Yes, you have to. You have to dedicate your life to this podcast, and that is what you do now. <laughs> and so to finish off this scene, Margaret says to her kid, you know, as like that term effect, she's like, oh, I could just eat you alive. And Morticia is shocked. She's like, oh, no, Margaret, too young. <laughs> <laughs> they don't write dialogue like this anymore. Ugh. Exactly. I mean, like I said, I don't think the the quip writer and the plot writer were coordinating, but it's so fantastic at times. So now we're watching the talent show, a bunch of kids dressed as flowers sing a dumb song. And clearly the Adams are bored by this. A lot of the parents are bored. My note here is the Adams family reacts appropriately to shitty ass kids play. Yes, very <laughs> appropriate reaction to kids plays. Yes. Or dance recital or piano performance or whatever. Did you notice as well that the judge did a little eye twitch as well? <laughs> like even, even he was flinching at it. And here's the thing. My opinion is, if you have kids, you deserve this. I feel nothing for you. Do you feel anything for anyone, though, Nick? In all honesty? Not a thing. Contempt? He feels contempt <laughs> on a regular basis. I feel contempt. But in general, I am dead inside and have been for most of my life. That is something you should all know about me. The the hope was that this movie would bring out just a little bit of feeling. Oh, it did. And those feelings promptly died. Listeners, I have to say, Nick, Nick gave the most incredible reaction to this. And then he said, I think I finally found a married couple that i like in movies yeah morticia and gomez adams like they are soppy and in love and over the top and i didn't hate them mark your calendar this actually happened i'm like actually this is a (laughs) fictitious couple who i wouldn't mind having their relationship so now fester comes to the school he changed his mind uh he brings something to wednesday and pugsley who are in costume for their scene to help them out with their performance Goes off and joins Gomez and Morticia in the seats. And somebody really should have warned the people in the front rows that they were going to be in the splash zone. Because <laughs> <laughs> they do their sword fight scene and they start cutting each other. And 
there's just torrential amounts of stage blood that come out. It's Tarantino levels of fountaining the blood. Yeah, <laughs> yeah my note here is that uh, they actually they actually accurately represent a standard Shakespeare play. It is shockingly <laughs> gory when you actually. <laughs> <laughs> There's eye gouging and so much stabbing and except it apparently not being Shakespeare. Like the lines they're reciting aren't actually from a Shakespeare play. No. Oh, no, not. where where are the lines from? If you they, they just wrote them, they couldn't get the rights to Shakespeare. <laughs> they could have. I don't think they wanted to. I'm pretty sure Shakespeare is firmly in the public domain at this point. It's but firmly anyway. in the public domain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Jurassic Park kid did Romeo and Juliet. So yeah, I mean, and so the entire like the first three rows just get covered in this stage blood. I mean, Pugsley's- And the judge's expression is priceless. Yeah, everyone else is horrified, especially the people who got doused with the blood. And so it's just a complete inverse of what we saw during the happy little flower scene. But the Adamses are fucking loving watching- They are eating this shit up. They're watching their kids- fake murder each other and they love it and again this was a scene my niece loved and she was watching it just like why can't i get to do stuff like this in school (laughs) i spent a couple christmases buying her like effects makeup stuff wow and she would do like cuts and slashes like a good uncle damn right (laughs) i hit my brother once and that was a fucking thing i was never i was never allowed to hit my brother Never got, and I was like watching them doing these stuff to each other. I'm like, God damn it. That's how siblings are supposed to be, mom. (laughs) (laughs) So while this is going on at the school, uh, Craven slash Dr. Pentishloss tries to sneak into the the, the house and is immediately attacked by sentient vines who just wrap her up and drag her away. Thankfully, all they did was just wrap her up because I was starting to get evil dead vibes from this. So back home, Fester tucks Wednesday in with her dolls into bed. And, you know, we kind of get the sense that, you know, she's finally accepting him as her uncle. And she also goes to sleep in vampire pose. That is how she... Which was (laughs) apparently her choice. This was not a directing note. Christina Ricci at that age decided that's the way Wednesday should sleep with her arms crossed across her chest. You see, children can act. This is not this an child issue. can act. There are many like her who can act. There are many like yes, her. Yes, but if you're gonna put good kid performances up against the rest and tell me that it's typically a good idea to have child actors. This is going to come to blood. I'm sure sh- I'm saying that they are capable. So you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> but also Christina Ricci is the reason why they definitively say that he is the real Uncle Fester. Because apparently they were going to leave it ambiguous. And Christina Ricci's like, no, that's ridiculous. We should know by the end that he's actually Uncle Fester. And the director agreed. And they changed it. And that's why that bullshit lines. Oh, that's why the bullshit ending happened. Okay. Okay. So yeah, you shouldn't let, so the moral of the story is don't let them direct, even if they don't let them write or direct. (laughs) I mean, no, here's the thing. Like, yeah, they should not have left it ambiguous. That would have not have been a satisfying ending for a kid's movie. They could have maybe done it in a less ham fisted way. We'll get there, but yeah. So here comes a very, I feel like they needed to pad for a runtime scene. Because we're in the family cemetery now, and Gomez are, and Morticia are on the cemetery couch. Yeah, I didn't even take notes during this part. I just kind of spaced it. Yeah, I love the dialogue, um, as, as usual, between these two. Uh, but my note was, once they get to the end of it, and they start flash-cutting to all the statues, my note was, is this supposed to be sex metaphor here? Well, of course. It's Gomez and Morticia. <laughs> Everything ends in sex. Because the flash cuts are manic for whatever kind of sex they have in this graveyard. Yeah, they definitely have sex in this graveyard. There's like a three-headed dude. There's a... (laughs) The entire dialogue is just, you know, talking about how they met at a funeral. It was their first one. They were instantly in love with each other. He was a suspect. I I don't want to ruin it too much because I still think our listeners should go out and rewatch it because it's a hidden gem in my opinion. Or maybe not that hidden, but it's, it's a gem. Worth rewatching. Yeah, no, absolutely. This is a good movie. We, this is on the Millennial Rewind recommend list. 
you know, it, it ends with her, you know, mentioning that they're going to be corpses rotting together and matching coffins, whatever. And this turns Gomez on. There's no narrative function to this scene. It doesn't add to the story. It doesn't add to the characters. It just feels like this scene was there to pad out the runtime. Uh, next morning, Lurch finds Craven tied up in vines in the greenhouse. At least the vines were kind enough to bring her inside. Yeah, you know, it was cold. They kept her wrapped and warm. It was nice. (laughs) And Lurch barely has any makeup on in this scene. Because, again, it's very inconsistent. He just, just, I think they (laughs) lightly tapped some makeup on him. He's supposed to have, like, a kind of grayish face because he's a Frankenstein's monster. But so now we're at breakfast. Wednesday's food is, like, alive. The food of this movie is alive. And so Morticia says, Wednesday, play with your food. <laughs> like it's a pet that she has to like keep entertained. It's so, <laughs> so good. And so Fester and Pugsley have apparently played a prank on Granny who finds a human skeleton arm in whatever she's cooking. And she's upset because that was supposed to be from when they had guests. <laughs> That's why she's pissed. They use the good bones. <laughs> <laughs> You'd never use the good bones. <laughs> That's for company, damn it. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> but it also shows us that Fester and Pugsley are tight. He's tight with both the kids. And he's just behaving more as an Adams than than the Gordon self that he would be. Yeah. Uh, so Craven and her Dr. Penterschloss character comes in, tells them that Foster needs to leave, that Fester needs to leave them because um, reasons. But they're going to throw him a party before he goes away. They're not going to let him go without it. Outside, as she leaves the property, you know, Fester pleads with her to stay. But she's like, no, they're not there. They're not your real family. I'm your I'm your real family. Then we are getting a preview of the ballroom where they're going to have this party. Everything's covered up in sheets. Gomez turns to Morticia and asks, oh, Tish. How long has it been since we've waltzed? And they start waltzing, and she says, oh, Gomez, hours. (laughs) Because they're the best couple. They're the best couple. So the dancing match cuts to the party. We're now at the party in that same room. It's all got freaky, deaky Adamses of all stripes dancing. This seems like a very incestuous family. (laughs) Because of Lumpy Adams? Lumpy Adams is the only accurate portrayal of uh, of teenagers in movies that I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, he's got the awkward braces. He's got the dumb hair. The he's... giant hunch. He's a ugly as shit. He's just naturally disfigured. Yeah. Yeah. That's the only accurate portrayal of teenagers I've ever seen. And Wednesday is dancing with Lumpy. Also, we meet Cousin It. It doesn't contribute to the plot much, but he's just awesome. It's nice to see him. Yeah, absolutely. He was one of my favorite characters. Plus, plus, there is a slight resolution of a side plot with the wife. This is true. So there is a little contribution here. Then we also have the conductor of the band who has the fakest hair that's ever been applied to a human <laughs> being. <laughs> yes, the conductor of the band who looks like something out of Middle Earth. <laughs> With a handlebar mustache. And the eyebrows and everything. Like, they just kind of gra- got grabbed some spirit gum and just pulled hair out and st- pushed it on there and went, done. It is the worst looking shit I've ever seen. Someone casually playing the cobra in the front row of the band. It's... I thought that was a nice touch. Instead of, like, a, a clarinet or an oboe or something, they were actually playing the cobra. Very good CGI as well in a movie that does not always have very good CGI. <laughs> oh, also, um, just for anyone who doesn't know who Cousin It is, uh, he's a member of the family who looks like the stuff that you pull out of your shower drain uh came to life he's well combed yeah he is very very well groomed i imagine it'd be very soft to touch as well it looks like his uh his conditioner game is very much on point he's the only person who can wear a fedora and pull it off i thought he had a bowler it was a bowler hat maybe it was no it wasn't a bowler hat it was like like a bowler hat but with like a flat top like a humber <laughs> something like that nick knows war i know hats <laughs> yes <laughs> How do we combine our powers, John? And I know nothing. <laughs> and I hate Christians. <laughs> <laughs> so Morticia sends Wednesday up to check on her uncle. And then Morticia gets really flirty with Lumpy Adams. She definitely gives some bedroom eyes to this awkward humpbacked teenager who's 
I guess, a cousin of hers. You gotta give him some confidence, you know. So Wednesday stumbles upon Craven and Fester conspiring. As a matter of fact, Craven's shaving Fester's head with a straight razor, which I would not be comfortable with personally. And so Wednesday hears the conspiratorial things going on in there, and she screams, I knew you were a fake, which is not great stealth. Maybe you sneak off and tell somebody as opposed to drawing all this attention to yourself. But we need some action. We need to keep the plot going. A chase scene ensues. And then Wednesday manages to escape Fester's clutches out her own chute that lands outside. And this is where they've swapped the positions of the Pugsley (laughs) escape hatch and the Wednesday escape hatch. Now the Wednesday one's on the left and the Pugsley one's on the right. They'll swap back again later in the movie, but... (laughs) Those those outdoor vines are hard at work reshaping the house every now and again. You know, you got you got to change things just to change things sometimes. You know. I'm sorry. Are you implying that the doors don't move themselves? Excuse me. Pardon you. <laughs> so Fester chases Wednesday out into the cemetery. So we're back at the party again. Uh, Gomez runs into Flora and Fauna, and we see that they're actually conjoined twins who are romantic competitors. <laughs> Because they're super bummed that Morticia managed to bag Gomez, but they're also pissed at each other for getting in each other's way. Shenanigans. Morticia comes in and, you know, calms them down by assuring them that, you know, you're twice the woman I am. Because that's a literal fact. Waka waka. I liked it. I did too, actually. That was a good one. So Gomez and Morticia pass off Tully onto Flora and Fauna. Tully, for some reason, discusses family business with Flora and Fauna, mentions that, oh no, they mentioned to him that since Fester's back and he's the older brother, he's entitled to the house and all the money. Which he would know and they wouldn't. Right, being the family lawyer. And casual exposition at this point in the movie is too late. No, you've you've had an entire f- over first half of the movie to to expose it. You can't throw additional e- exposition at this point. That's just lazy. But how are we going to get a third act? Also, on the other side of the room, we notice that Margaret and Uncle and uh, cousin It are starting to get a little cozy. Well, she's still weirded out at this point, but he's putting the moves on her. I actually kind of like this. How cousin It wins her over with his smooth chirpy voice that we don't understand <laughs> yes damn right. with his gibberish so fester having failed to catch wednesday he returns to the party and gomez insists that they dance the mamushka which is the traditional family dance that has been in the family for generations ever since the cossack adams has brought it in and during this sequence did you notice the one black adams <laughs> i did yeah. representation but he's like kind of in white face, <laughs> like the makeup they put on him. Well, how else are you supposed to be black and goth? I don't have an answer for that. Black goths, let us know how you do it. You need to have the super pale makeup like all the other nonconformists. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a moment of tension because we think that Fester is going to fuck up the dance and be revealed as a fraud. However, this incredibly elaborate dance that involves you know, smacking swords together and slapping each other and flips and shit. And juggling them at each other. <laughs> yeah, he just knows it naturally, and it ends with him having a sword fall into his throat. Catching a sword in his mouth, but in like a sword swallower's pose. And that sword definitely went through the back of his head. <laughs> there was no way that length could not have burst straight through his skull. What are you talking about? No. Compared to the length of the other ones. The angle was weird. It went down his throat. Yes, but the direction of his teeth had the sword in a way that it was going to go right through the back of his head, not down his throat. Some swords are curved. That one wasn't. We see the other swords and they're all identical. (laughs) Destroys any way out. No, what the scene (laughs) destroys is any sort of believability that Raul Julia is doing the juggling. (laughs) Well, that too. (laughs) They have a decent stand-in for Fester on, like, the wide shot where they're juggling him back and forth. But for Gomez, there is no comparison whatsoever. There is no, 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 you can't. You can't. So Fester, nailing this dance, convinces Gomez once and for all that this is Fester, this is his brother. And also, Fester just had an amazing time. Like, Fester is so happy about, you know, he feels a part of the family. And so while this is all going on, Tully leaves the party. 
goes next door to ask the judge neighbor who keeps getting his windows destroyed by golf balls whether or not he'd like to get rid of the Adams family for good. Are you telling me that all lawyers aren't upstart, honest citizens? And the judge is like really into this without knowing quite what he's proposing. Like he could be asking to murder here. And the judge is just like, tell me more. I feel like this judge would be down to murder the Adams family. He's just had so many golf balls smack through his window. He would go there. Yeah, I'm not denying that. I'm just saying he's agreeing a little too hastily. Uh, so back at the party, things are starting to wind down. Margaret and Cousin It are now getting cozy on the balcony. We kind of get the sense that she's not happy in her marriage. I mean, we know this, but she's she's revealing it to Cousin It kind of implying that they're getting a little more intimate. Flora and Fauna smooch Fester, you know, basically tell him to call them because they know that he's going to be loaded soon. And then they get put in a straitjacket. Yeah, they get taken back to the insane <laughs> asylum. And also this cousin Nick comes out and he gets into his like, what is this car? The Itmobile. <laughs> the Itmobile. So this is custom made for it. No, I don't know. I just, that's what I call it. I think there there's a genuine like Volkswagen three wheeler car like this. There was a German three wheeler car. Um, they used it in Brazil again, a movie I mentioned in Homeward Bound, but it's not quite the same. Like it's a different sort of model, so I'm not sure what this is. I think there might be a car like this that actually exists. I know that the they they have retro cars, the Adams family anyway. So I think it's probably like just a little up to date. And also, Cousin It clearly gives Margaret an indecent proposal right before he drives away. <laughs> She's like, no, we can't. I'm married. And then he's just like, I'll call you. Because clearly whatever he says is way more appealing than being married to Tully. Fester's like super happy about the, the mamushka. He's like dancing down the hallways. He goes back to his room. And then Craven just rains on his parade and emotionally manipulates him back into rejoining the scam. Like, oh, you're not my real son, and of all the things I've done for you, like, really, you know. Mother? Who's mother? That's not my boy. He wouldn't say such things. Back in the ballroom the next day, Gomez and Morticia find Pugsley on a serving tray. They open a serving tray, and he's just sleeping in it. That's where he spent the night. This is such a wonderful shot. So Wednesday is missing. Nobody's seen Wednesday. And this triggers an all-family manhunt. It is all hands-on-deck people whipping out maps saying, you, go check out this part of the property. You, go check the well. You, and then Fester's like, hey, I, well, I'm, I should stay back here because what if she comes back? And Gomez's like, ah, good thinking. And so everyone starts looking around for Wednesday. And this is the one shot where things, effects get a little janky. He's jumping on the, the lily pads. And you kind of see this weird aura around him that kind of makes it feel like he's not there. We see little glimpses of it from time to time. But in, in general, the hand acting on thing is is phenomenal and the cgi is pretty good yeah this is like the one moment where it kind of showed its age but in general yeah it's incredible the the hand acting that's to come is so good <laughs> there's there's one hand acting moment which i just thought i don't know how many actors they had doing the hand things but my god it was one guy really good and eventually gomez finds wednesday sleeping in a mausoleum in the family cemetery so the family returns, but the gate has caution tape on it. What's up with that? Gate has been muzzled. Yes, gate has been muzzled. And Tully tells them that he's gotten a restraining order against them. And they can't come within a thousand feet of the house. So uh, they're definitely violating their restraining order already. There's a bit more. So basically, he lets them know, you know, Fess is the rightful owner of the house. He really wasn't over the flora and fauna thing. So he's kicking you out. Get the fuck out. He does. He, he saw him again and it brought up all this trauma. He's like, you know, we're going to challenge this in court. And Gomez, ever the optimist, says that they will prevail in the courts. And his line here is, they say that a man who represents him has a fool for a client. Well, God is my witness. I am that fool. And so we cut to the courtroom, and of course the judge is their neighbor, and he cannot fucking wait to rule against them. Did you guys notice the New York City flag behind the judge? Okay, so we're in New York. What? 
How the fuck are they in New York City? They live in a house on a hill. There's no houses on the hill in New York City. Not in 1991, there aren't. Well, they didn't even they couldn't even afford a uh, over the shoulder shot of the Adams family in that particular cut. I think they could only afford one shot of the judge sitting at the well, top. Yeah, this is a very cheap court set. <laughs> I mean, this movie ran $5 million over budget, so they had to cut corners somewhere. It, it was the courthouse, and it was Lurch's makeup. That's where they saved some money. And a lot of the mamushka is supposed to be a an elaborate, full song and dance number. And we only got snippets of it. And so, unsurprisingly, the judge rules that Fester gets to keep all the family possessions and fortune. However, he's going to let Gomez keep his golf balls. And he goes about it in the weirdest way. He's like, Gomez Adams, these are yours. And he has his bucket that he just pours out in the courtroom. This is the point at which the judge got investigated for very strange and senile behavior. It's like, no, no, I get that he had it handy. He obviously knew this case was coming up. But the fact that he pours them out into the courtroom is the weird. Yeah, is this the last case that he's seeing that day? Because if he's got other stuff on the docket, they got to clean that up. That's going to put him behind schedule. Like, that's, yeah. That's what the court stenographer is for. (laughs) Despite the restraining order, the family is somehow allowed back at the house to pack up their stuff. And Thing has a wagon full of stuff. He's got a, like a red. That is adorable. He's got gloves. Everything in his wagon is a hand-related product, which is just such a beautiful touch. And as they drive away, Fester watches them out the window, looking very sad. And so immediately, Craven, Fester, and Tully uh, try to get into the vault, and they all fail to pull the correct chain to activate the slide. They all get shot out the shoots, and once again, the shoots have swapped places now. Pugsley on the left, Wednesday on the right. <laughs> and so the rest of the family is now set up in a motel. I wish there was more of this, of the Adams interacting in the outside world. But at this point, there's literally 20 minutes left in the movie. But there is so much in this 20 minutes. <laughs> there's a lot. They jam in a lot. They jam in like a whole second act in the third act. It's crazy. And so Morticia gives everyone an inspirational speech, you know, even though things are looking bad, you know, because we're Adams is and everyone cheers because we're Adams is. And Wednesday is eating the same cereal as the judge was eating when he got splashed. Well, what I wanted to bring up is that uh, she's talking about the story of the tortoise and the hare. And um, they go around the circle and says, what does this story mean? And they all give up their own kooky moral of the story and my note here is somehow we stole this idea from the movie shame on us <laughs> <laughs> learning lessons isn't unique to the adams family learning twisted lessons <laughs> that's what we do uh, yep it's now time to begin the product placement segment of the movie with 20 minutes to go yeah because they read over budget they needed to make up for it even though they just eat cereal <laughs> yeah cereal brand cereal so firstly, Pugsley and Wednesday are going to try to make some money by selling poison lemonade. There's just a whole slew of vials of various... <laughs> and this uh, lemonade stand is brought to you by Tombstone Pizza. They're across the street from a giant Tombstone Pizza, so anytime there's someone talking to them, you get an ad for pizza in the back. Yeah, in this first one, they give Lurch a, a lemonade on the house... And he reacts like a cartoon character. One thing I will say, this movie is very cartoony, but it knows it, and it leans into it, and it works. Because, yeah, he belches, Lurch does, he belches a fireball, and he chars one of the Indian statues that apparently decorates this motel. Those were a thing. You can still see them at some places around the country, but they used to be very much more prevalent. Typically cigar shops. So Morticia, we cut to Morticia. Yeah, she's in an employment agency. You know, employment is like, you know, it's great. It's fine. A lot of homemakers entering the workforce right now. Uh, So what did you major in in college? And Morticia says, spells and hexes. And this perplexes the employment agency lady. And she's like, ah. Liberal arts. (laughs) (laughs) 
God, I love that. And this employment agency lady, she is definitely of the time. Late 80s, early 90s. Oh, in terms of hair and outfit. The colorful jacket with the shout. The sh- yeah, it definitely had the foam shoulder pads in her, you know, in her pantsuit top because she has a career as a woman, you know. So they have to look boxy like men. <laughs> but don't worry, they'll get ruined in a second. <laughs> So now we're back at the lemonade stand, and a Girl Scout comes up to them. Oh, oh. yes. This is the best line from the movie. And she, you know, this she's very stuck up. Like, imagine a little blonde girl. Very stuck up. She's like, look, I only drink real lemonade made with organic lemons and no preservatives. She's California bullshit, Girl Scout. Oh. Is this lemonade made with actual lemons? I mean, like, on natural ingredients. Well, tell you what. If you give me some lemonade, I'll give you Girl Scout cookies. No, not even give. If you, I will buy some lemonade from you. If you buy a box of cookies from me, I am pretty sure the cookies cost more. You are coming out way better in this deal you're proposing, little girl. But it's all a setup for one of the greatest lines in the movie. You know, re- referencing these Girl Scout cookies, she asks the girl, "Are, are they, they made, made from real Girl, girl Scouts?" Scouts? <laughs> So good. And again, just this deadpan delivery Christina Ricci's been doing the whole fucking movie. Just matter of fact. It's And here's the thing. This girl is such a hypocrite because I can guarantee you those Girl Scout cookies are not made with all natural organic ingredients without preservatives. Like, go fuck yourself. Exactly. She didn't say she ate them. She's just hawking them. Yeah, but you're a hypocrite if you're hawking them and you're so fucking insistent on your the stuff that you consume being a certain way and then you selling the stuff that are the opposite of that. Hey, don't hate the play. I hate the game. I hate both. The amount of hatred you could cram into this sequence and the beautiful response is just, you know, probably the most badass little girl response ever. Now we get a brief view of Morticia trying her head at being a kindergarten substitute teacher. Oh my God, I so forgot this part of the movie. This made my night three times over. So she's telling these little kids, uh, you're coming in at the very end of Hansel and Gretel, in which uh, Hansel and Gretel are wicked children who trick the witch and stuff her in the oven (laughs) where she burns alive. Now... What do you all think that felt like (laughs) to these little kids who just start crying their fucking eyes? I and I think the production made these kids cry for real. (laughs) This is this is genuine crying. They definitely did something that got them genuinely crying. Absolutely. We're really watching children cry in this movie. And I love this movie so much more because of it. <laughs> I've seen stuff and I've been part of videos where you do like weird story time to children. And you it's pretty easy to get them to sit there and either look bored or like, what? But to get crying, that's a whole other level right there. They definitely did something to scare the shit out of these kids. Or like they lied to them about ice cream or something. I don't know. They lied to them about ice cream. They, like, killed a bunny in front of them. Like, (laughs) either or. And now we get a FedEx commercial. I'm sorry. I mean, Thing gets a job at FedEx. This was literally a FedEx commercial. Get the fuck out of here. What? Thing walking. Yeah, Thing walking around and the packages being flung was this footage was literally used in a commercial. I believe it because it's (laughs) so jammed in there. Yeah. With Federal Express before they went by FedEx for so long. Yeah, Federal Express. Da 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 da. And you need your packages there. Did they include the section where Thing runs under the girl's dress as she's bending over to pick something up? Probably. It was 90s. (laughs) But the question is did they include Thing doing his job search? Uh, You know, it's 1991 when Thing is looking for a job in the newspaper. Thing FedEx commercial. And the MC Hammer video. I've got a. I've got some YouTube. Oh to God! Do. Why do you torture us, John? You learn from Wednesday. I do what I want to do. Say what I want to say. Live. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. I, I think I mentioned something about needing to go play in traffic earlier. <laughs> Listener, if you knew how painful that was. Back at the motel, Gomez is super depressed and he's eating junk food and he's watching TV. He's watching some random daytime 
talk show. Like Sally Jesse Raphael. Oh, this is a real person. This is a real show. Accurate portrayal of American TV is what I put. Its format has basically involved like nowadays we have like Dr. Phil, where it's supposedly serious. Geraldo Rivera had the show. Um well well back before he was somehow became a respected journalist. I don't know how that happened. Because, yeah, he had these trashy daytime talk shows where they talk about the new, like, satanic panic or whatever big problem was sweeping the nation. Yeah, the big problem sweeping the nation right now is voodoo witches. (laughs) Voodoo witches and cultists. And she's like, oh, we have a call. Sally. (laughs) And she's like, Mr. Adams, please, we don't actually know where they are. Stop calling us. (laughs) (laughs) Morticia suggests they go for a drive, but Gomez is like, no, then we're going to miss Gilligan's Island. Uh, This is where Granny comes in with a club telling them that dinner's going to be late. And she walks back outside and you hear animal, like, dog or cat noises. Uh, It's both a dog and a cat. It's it's anything she can come across, yeah. Yeah, it's domestic animals for dinner. Uh, so back at the Adams house, we see Fester, who's super sad, eating dinner with Craven. He misses the family. That evening, Morticia and Thing return to the house to try and confront Fester. Well, Morticia it's decides it's time to do something about it, so she goes out. She's pretty badass in this point. She is, yeah. She, she takes some initiative. So as soon as she arrives, Tully straps her to a rack. Not the country, right? Stretching rack, yeah, and oh, another great Morticia line here because Craven's in there, and she says to Craven, "You're a desperate woman, consumed by greed and bitterness. We could have been such friends." <laughs> <laughs> so good. <laughs> Morticia's full of great lines. Like, as, as they're tightening it later, she's just got this like, "Oh, you've done this before." She is into getting tortured on this rack. This is not her first time. When she works out that other people have operated one before, she can tell. <laughs> that's why That's why I'm not going to put a big shout about the cliche of rescuing, you know, the damsel in distress, because she doesn't need rescuing. She's just having the time of her life here. She's loving this. But Thing... <laughs> doesn't quite pick up on that he runs back to the motel because he wants needs to warn gomez i love how well a hand can get exasperated unbelievable (laughs) hand acting here so he gets home by grabbing onto the bumper of a car well home being the motel and he runs in and he's dodging cars up and down he's hitting the deck he's so good the the hand acting is fantastic and so he gets back to the the motel and again with the cereal because Gomez is now eating the colored ball brand cereal <laughs> and he's trying to convey to Gomez what's happening at first he's trying sign language like you could do one handed sign language and he's trying to do that but he's going so fast he's basically just trying to spell everything out and it's not working Gomez is like I hate it when you stutter <laughs> And so he gets reduced to doing it with Morse code by smacking the spoon against the table. Yeah, but he like steals the spoon and swats the cereal out of the way. And he's just, he, he has just this fuck tantrum moment. <laughs> it's seriously just a hand and you can tell it wants to face palm so fucking hard at Gomez. He's got the palm, <laughs> just doesn't have the face for it. And right at the very end, after all this climactic, you know, squirming goes on superb hand acting the hand does this thing where it just sort of collapses exhausted like it's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he had to hold on to the back of the speedy car so, so back at the adams family house craven has heated up a red hot poker and gives it to fester to burn her to tell them where the vault is how to get in the vault But they are interrupted by Gomez and Thing bursting through the window. And my thought here was, you might have wanted to bring Lurch, too. I feel like Lurch (laughs) would have been a big help in rescuing Morticia. He's a big guy. Oh, no, that's not Gomez. That's not Gomez. He goes straight in. He flies through the window by himself with his sword ablazing. So we get Gomez and Tully 
dueling again. Yeah, my note here is that there's no tension to this because Tully has never beaten Gomez in a sword fight and you can't imagine he ever would. Right. I mean, you think that he might because he cuts Gomez's hand, but then Gomez is like, oh, now it's on. One for you. And then he disarms him and he puts both of the swords around his neck and he goes, and one for me. And I just sat there going, do it. Do <laughs> Exactly, right? Now you are going to Star Wars route, but it's true. It is uh, It is the moment in episode three where Anakin has both lightsabers over Dooku. So Craven at this point pulls out a pistol and tells Gomez to take Fester to the vault. And if they're not back in one hour, she's going to shoot Morticia. Again, I'd like to remind everybody that uh, Tully is the one that owes her money, and she is putting a fuck ton of effort. Yeah. Just, I need to remind people that this is where we are. This is a very involved loan shark. <laughs> but then she commits the cardinal sin, which is interrupting Gomez and Morticia's love passion speeches. She does, because they almost fuck on the torture wheel <laughs> she's such a buzz like she's such a buzz kill that even the romantic music stops cold that swells in the background and so craven berates fester and finally he's had enough of her shit he takes a book off the shelf called hurricane irene and as we mentioned earlier the books on the adams family shelf have elemental powers so when he opens it up it literally blasts tully and craven with a hurricane and disarms craven one more thing electrocutes his brain come on i mean gone with the wind was just wind the hurricane has rain and thunder and lightning and you know everything you would expect but it electrocutes his brain. You're, you're saying that like there's an issue here. I'm not following. Hurricane Ex Machina is the issue. <laughs> the whole Ex Machina trope is that it literally comes out of nowhere. This was set up with the Gone with the Wind book. God forcing him to regain his memories is the force here. <laughs> as well as the subsequent conclusion that we will get to as well. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's bullshit. <laughs> It is literally the force, though, because the lightning that comes out of the books might as well have been the force lightning that comes out of Palpatine's hands in the Jedi. It is literally the same effect. I pride myself that I've turned these two guys into the guys who are turning everything into Star Wars. You see, my mission is complete, dear listener. It's not everything <laughs> in Star Wars. It's literally the effect looks like the the lightning, like like effects technology had not advanced. Yeah, we're that not much. reaching for shit when we make our. Reference. Oh. Oh, you are 100% reaching. For okay, shit. so yeah, this, you know, and while this is going on, I love this because Gomez is unstrapping Morticia from the the wheel that she's on. She got moved from a like a rack to a wheel. That's what she's been strapped on. Gomez is lying here. Leather straps, red hot pokers. And Morticia says back to him, later, my dearest. <laughs> it's so good. It's so good. So good. I fucking love the lines in this movie. Craven and Tully, they are thrown out of the window and they land in coffins that Pugsley and Wednesday have prepared. Why are Pugsley and Wednesday here all of a sudden? Go fuck yourself, audience. Just deal with and go fuck yourself in the good way, because this is such a great scene. Because they <laughs> land in the coffins, the coffins close. Pugsley turns to Wednesday and asks, are they dead? To which Wednesday replies, does it matter? The implication being that they're going to bury these coffins and not give a fuck if they are alive or not. This is Schrodinger's coffin. <laughs> but would they really put them in the family graveyard? Are they family? I guess the lawyer they knew quite well. They knew the lawyer quite well, but it's also keep your family close and keep your enemies closer. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's not like they're going to get a statue to him. So we get a super that lets us know that it is now seven months later. Uh, Lurch scares away some trick-or-treaters by being himself. Yeah, which is really weird. Any other day, I would understand it, but he opens the door and they see someone who looks spooky on Halloween. Kid's reaction isn't correct. Huh? I mean, if you made it to that house, you've already got nerves of fucking steel on Halloween. <laughs> So why is seeing Lurch freaking you out so much? If you've made it past Gate. Yeah, Gate that opens up and talks to you. I don't think in 1991 Halloween decorations were that sophisticated. Also, we get our second black person in this movie. There's a <laughs> little black girl that's with the group of trick-or-treaters. And that is all the diversity you get, motherfuckers. 
1991. <laughs> Inside the house, Pugsley has dressed up as Fester for Halloween, and Fester finds this very flattering. Margaret and it arrive, and they are clearly an item. She doesn't give a fuck that her husband is missing and or dead. And I love the line, Cousin It, I almost didn't recognize you. <laughs> His cousin It's in a cowboy outfit. But he's still a walking wig. <laughs> I know. But he's got a cowboy hat and like a neckerchief around him. And the... <laughs> but Margaret notices that Wednesday doesn't appear to have a costume on. She's just kind of dressed as herself. Oh, God, another amazing line. Yes, to and uh, Wednesday addresses this by saying, this is my costume. I'm a homicidal maniac. They look just like everyone else. Beautiful. Just fucking beautiful. My note here is just, I fucking love Wednesday. That's that is yep. my only note here. I think everyone did after this movie. And so now we get a Baywatch style end of story exposition dump. <laughs> Where everyone in the family room collectively mentions how Fester got his memory back. This is the stupidest shit. It was through the lightning, the coincidence of him showing up. They they couldn't even address it. Morticia just says, stranger things has happened. And no, that doesn't mean you get away with the strange coincidence of him being there yeah, at your so house. Yeah, so the explanation for this is that he actually is Fester. He actually did get lost in the Bermuda Triangle and lost his memory. Discount Frau Farbissima found him and brainwashed him into thinking he's her son. And then he wound up exactly where he should have wound up. And yeah. does he really is Fester? I always hated this. I always hated this. And he was actually found in a tuna net off the coast of Florida. It was... But it was 25 years ago, not a month ago. Right, but the best lies are told from truth. So Yeah, that didn't bother me, but the odds of him showing up showing up to the same house yeah. is just yeah. stupid. Yeah, this is this is literally like <laughs> David Hasselhoff explains the resolution of the film, the resolution of the end of the Baywatch episode. Uh now it is time to play a game. Because it's Halloween. You gotta play a game together, and they decide they're gonna play they're gonna play Wake the Dead. And everyone grabs a shovel and th there's a there's teams involved because there's a discussion about who's going to be, you know, whether Wednesday or Pugsley are going to be on Fester's team for Wake of the Dead. And so it involves grabbing shovels and just going into the cemetery and digging up their dead relatives while making as much noise as possible and yelling at them. <laughs> right. So my question here is, can they actually wake the dead or are they just doing some good old-fashioned grave robbing. It's your own, yeah, it's your own graveyard, so. <sighs> well, yeah, I mean, not grave robbing, but just desecrating a grave. Casual exhuming. But they're talking to their dead relatives as if them digging them up will wake them from the dead. As Wednesday would say, does it matter? <laughs> <laughs> and also while this is going on, Morticia reveals that she has been knitting a onesie, implying that she is pregnant. And knows the freak will have three legs. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> it's got three-legged onesie. I don't tend to throw the F word around very much like that. But this kid is a freak. <laughs> and, yeah, it goes like, is it true? It is, my darling. And Which just means more sex. It just means more sex. But here's the thing. Given how often these two clearly fuck, I am surprised they don't have a litter of children. Yes, I was going to come back to this by the end of the movie as well. <laughs> How is it they only have two and one on the way? They should have enough kids to make a Mormon family jealous. Like, that is how lustful they are towards each other. We pull away from the house while they kiss. And this is really weird because they we see them kissing as we pull away at the front door. But the implication of the action that has preceded this is that they are at the door looking out towards the cemetery which would be a different door fuck me okay cool um <laughs> <laughs> instead of getting the adams family theme song which would have been a nice way to to end things oh off, no fuck that we need to have a tie-in with mc hammer we get an mc fucking hammer song god damn fucking it. disaster and i remembered a little bit of this song i did not recall the number of fucking times they had to throw in too legit. 
Oh my god. Which came from another MC Hammer um hit at the time, <laughs> Too Legit to Quit. But they just throw the light too legit. Too legit. Just randomly in this fucking song. I guess they didn't expect your average white audience to know who the fuck MC Hammer was unless you had his theme song. I don't know. No, everyone knew who MC Hammer was. He disappeared very shortly after. The dude had a Saturday morning cartoon. I'm sorry, what now? Yes, MC Hammer had a Saturday morning cartoon called Hammer Man. It, he was his normal self. I forget what his real name is, but he, he'd be like his normal self. But he'd put on these special dance shoes that made him all awesome like MC Hammer, and he had music powers. Oh, guess what's going right on the fucking <laughs> list? <laughs> Not before James Bond Jr., damn it. Not before, but deal. James Bond Jr. first. <laughs> Why do you hurt me so? Oh, and that was the Adams Family. But before we let you go, audience, you know that we as millennials know that every single movie and TV show has a moral. Saturday morning cartoons did that to us. So, Jules... What did you learn today? What I learned is that Americans have been modeling themselves after the wrong family. It's this family, people. That's right. Forget that leave it to beaver bullshit. And Ja, what did you learn? I learned that an apple can stop a crossbow bolt. (laughs) Science. Yeah, I didn't know that either. (laughs) It's good to know. Citation needed, motherfucker. (laughs) And I learned that my attempts to kill my brother weren't... normal behavior it's just a healthy part of growing up mom (laughs) Mom. (laughs) i never tried to kill my brother (laughs) good thing i can edit that out (laughs) shit this is gonna be used in court (laughs) Uh, before we go we gotta tell you what we're doing next time john what do the folks at home have to look forward to oh another classic that we'll see how it ages the original ghostbusters Oh, baby, I this this might be one of those ones that's too good to make fun of directly, but we will see. And do you have a review for us to get us all titillated? This was a one star review. (laughs) I'm very curious. (laughs) This review is not about the movie. The movie is and always will be a classic. (laughs) What this review is about is the 4K version. The picture quality is absolutely appalling. It's the worst 4K movie I have seen yet, and the quality is on par with the VHS copy. (laughs) (laughs) This is exactly the kind of person that Wednesday would torture to death. The grain is everywhere. It's so bad you can see it on the walls, floors, faces. It's on everything. It looks like TV snow. Oh, my God. Well, that is very exciting. And that's our show. If you liked it, please subscribe. If you loved it, please share it with all your friends. And whether you liked it or loved it, we'd appreciate it if you gave us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts to help others find us also be sure to like our facebook page and follow us on twitter links to both of those are in the show notes thanks for listening and we'll see you next time for another episode of millennial rewind